Hi, this is Miles Marie, the Soldier of Mary. So this is part of a new series looking at insights from Catholic mystics and saints. I've discovered, as I've read more and more spiritual books, that there's so much of the life of our Lord and His Holy Mother that is not contained in the Gospels. In fact, the Gospels themselves say this, don't they? Uh, in St. John's Gospel, he, he tells us this, that, that not all the books in all the libraries of the world could be filled with all the events that our Lord did. And our Lord and his Holy Mother have chosen to reveal many of these mysteries to saints and mystics. And also in the early church, some of these traditions were passed down, that traditions that are not contained in sacred scripture. In this first episode, I want to talk about some of the mystical insights of Venerable Mary of Agrida. She's a great saint that many of you would have heard of because she's the author of the Mystical City of God. Mystical City of God is a huge work. I commend anyone, I congratulate anyone who has finished reading the Mystical City of God. It's um, eight volumes, eight, eight books, eight books within, is it three volumes, four volumes? Over about 1,500 pages, if you put it all together. Um, and, and in her work, Mystical City of God, there are so many insights into the life of our Lord and his Blessed Mother. And I thought I'd just share some of those. Now, I've read probably 90% of 90% of, of Mystical City of God. And, um, and so, you know, I probably haven't read every single page. That's because the book is quite unusual in that it, it flips back and forth from the saint, Venerable Mary of Agriga, giving her account of what occurs. And then like soliloquies or, 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 or pious dialogues between Our Lady and the Saint. And I mean, the pious dialogues between Our Lady and the Saint are really beautiful. But if you're reading a book for the sake of reading it, in order to find out insights from the life of Our Lord and His Holy Mother, that kind of area, well, at least I did, I, I glossed over some of those soliloquies and focused more on the, on Venerable Mary's accounts of, of Our Lord's life and the life of His Holy Mother. In fact, Mystical City of God is much more focused on Our Lady's life or Our Lady. She is the Mystical City of God. That's what the title of the book refers to. And so, so Venerable Mary's insights concern much more the joyful mysteries of the Rosary um, and the glorious mysteries of the Rosary. But actually, you know, actually the Sorrowful as well. It's only really if you're looking at the mysteries of light and you're thinking about events like the proclamation of the gospel and the baptism and um, the transfiguration that, well, actually, according to Venerable Mary of Agrida, and here's one of the insights, Our Lady was present at the transfiguration. She was kind of transported. She didn't climb the mountain with the apostles, but at the moment of the transfiguration, Our Lady was there mystically transported or physically and she witnessed it and Venerable Mary gives us an explanation as to why it was fitting that Our Lady would be present at the Transfiguration in particular because Our Lady was going to be involved with fostering the faith of the early church and this was a really important part of of what our Lord had done and so it was important that she knew about it and had experienced it so Venerable Mary of Agrida, um, let's give a bit more uh, structure to this to this episode. I'm going to talk a tiny bit about her, then I'll give some of the insights that she gives to us from these holy lives of Jesus and Mary. So Venerable Mary of Agrida, um, she is from the 17th century. She dies at about age 60 and she's one of these, I mean, she grew up in a Spain that was super holy. Uh, it wasn't the century of Spain's prosperity. That was probably a hundred years earlier with, you know, you had Philip II and, and uh, the Spanish Empire extending and Spain's economic and cultural um, dominance in Europe. The Venerable Mary is living after that, but it's a Spain that is deeply pious. There's no Protestantism, there's no heresy in Spain. It's a deeply pious country. And Venerable Mary of Agreda from her earliest years is gravitated towards 
religious life. Um, and she has um, a vocation from, from her earliest years. And her parents are very pious. And there's a quite a funny or interesting story that Venerable Mary and uh, she decides, yes, I'm going to join the convent. But then her own mum gets this vision, actually, we sh you shouldn't join the convent. Instead, our house should become the convent. And um, it sounds like the, <laughs> the husband, um, to begin with, wasn't 100% sure about this. That is um, Mary's, Venerable Mary's father. But actually, he came on board with it also. And he, he um, joined a friary and into religious life. And so, and their, their other children had already only two, uh, there was a, there was a, another sister, uh, and there were two brothers, I think from the top of my head, but they all entered religious life in the end. So it, it worked out fine. And Venerable Mary's home became the convent and they didn't just do it themselves. They brought in some experienced nuns to really get the convent going properly. Um, but Venerable Mary was elected abbess and she experienced mystical uh, insights from her earliest years, but later on, under the obedience to the spiritual director, she wrote the mystical city of God, which became popular, I suppose, from about um, 50 years after her lifetime, it becomes popular and it's translated into English. Oh, it takes a while to translate it into English, I think. But in the, by the time of the 19th century it's definitely in English and it's very well regarded and it's received many approvals from saints and popes and, and that kind of thing so let me try and give I don't want each of these videos to be too lengthy I'm going to try and gloss through some insights that our saint tells us things that aren't recorded in the gospel that are really fascinating and uh, interesting I've got some print out with uh, with various paragraphs so I'm going to look at them as I uh, speak to the camera. Um, so here we go. Let's get something to share with you first. So, okay, this is a really nice one. At the moment of the Annunciation, let me give you this uh, paragraph from the Mystical City. And I think I'll read this paragraph in full because it is so, uh, so uh, worthy of contemplation. At the pronouncing of this fiat, so sweet to the hearing of God and so fortunate for us. In one instant, four things happened. First, the most holy body of Christ our Lord was formed from the three drops of blood furnished by the heart of most holy Mary. Secondly, the most holy soul of the same Lord was created just as other souls. Third, the soul and the body were united in order to compose his perfect humanity. Fourth, the divinity itself un united itself in the person of the word with the humanity, which together became one composite being in hypostatical union. And thus was formed Christ, true God and man, our Lord and Redeemer. This happened in springtime on the 25th of March at break or dawning of the day in the same hour in which our first father Adam was made at the creation of the world. Not only did most holy Mary herself become a heaven, a temple and dwelling place of the most holy Trinity, but her humble cottage and her poor little oratory was consecrated by the divinity as a new sanctuary of God. The heavenly spirits who as witnesses of this marvelous transformation were present to contemplate, contemplate it. They magnified the Almighty with ineffable praise and jubilee. In union with this most happy mother, they blessed him in his name and in the name of the human race, which was ignorant of this, the greatest of his benefits and mercies. So that's a little snippet of the Annunciation scene that Venerable Mary of Agrida offers to us it's amazing it's so beautiful that's just a little snippet mystical city of god is so full of interior insights on how our lady was interiorly responding to each event that took place in our lord's life and god's working within her soul so let me let me give you something really beautiful here at the um the finding of the boy jesus in the temple there's this really beautiful insight we get into Our Lady's thoughts as she's worrying about her son. 
Here's, here's another little paragraph. The mother of wisdom then began to discuss within her heart the different possibilities. The first thought which presented itself to her was the fear lest Archelaus, imitating the cruelty of his father Herod, should have obtained notice of the presence of Jesus and have taken him prisoner. Although she knew from the holy scriptures and revelations, and by her conversations with her most holy son and teacher, that the time for his passion and death had not yet come, and that the king would not take away his life, yet she was filled with dread at the thought that they should have taken him prisoner and might ill-treat him. In her profoundest humility, she also had misgivings, lest perchance she had in any way displeased him by her conduct, and therefore deserved that he should leave her and take up his abode in the desert with his precursor, St. John. Imagine. I should have said precursor, shouldn't I? Anyway. <laughs> so imagine that one. A mystical insight into what's going on in Our Lady's mind as as she is seeking him and is searching for him. And actually, in the next uh, couple of sentences, Our Lady actually begins walking towards the desert because she's really convinced. She kind of inquires and she finds out he's not being arrested. And so she really thinks, oh, he must be with John. And then as she's leaving to go into the desert, that's when her guardian angels kind of say, actually, actually, blessed virgin, Actually, don't go there. He's he's not gone there. He's he's gone somewhere else. You'll you'll find him soon, and she does find him. She goes to a hospice, a hospital first, to see if he's tending for the sick. And when she sees he isn't there, that's when she directs her feet towards the temple, and she finds him at exactly the same time as Saint Joseph. They both come from kind of different angles, I think, and they they find him together. So that is a beautiful scene. Okay, um, I printed out loads of things, but let me jump to another one, which is an overarching theme of Mystical City of God, which is a major league insight. Um, she says, the Emerald Mayor of Agrida says that the evil one, uh, the devil, he, um, he does not at any point prior to our Lord being on the cross but at a particular moment of our lord being on the cross he has no certainty that jesus christ is true god and true man so basically it is hidden from him there's even some things which he should hear but he's been banished to hell while they're taking place for instance at the time of the um proto not the, yeah the the time of the creation of adam and eve that's hidden from him um, also the time of the annunciation that is hidden from him and there is point in our lord's public ministry where he various theophanies the devil is kind of forbidden from being present or, or forbidden from understanding or having his minions there and so the devil is not sure who our lord is whether he's just a pious prophet holy man whether he's or whether he is true god in the flesh he kind of knows from the proto-evangelium that he's going to be destroyed the devil knows that he's going to be defeated eventually but only, this is a really interesting insight now that i'm getting to during the passion satan begins to think maybe this is the redeemer maybe this is god in the flesh maybe he is the one and maybe my dominion over the human human race is going to be coming to an end and so the devil actually tries to halt try he's the devil's kind of divided because he's so wicked and he loves seeing a holy man suffer occasionally he he kind of lays into our lord but also there's another kind of misgiving in the devil's uh, evil nature that maybe this is the one who's going to conquer me and so the devil as the passion proceeds is actually trying to put a break on things um so for instance there's a story i won't read out the passage now because the this uh episode is going on quite long but there's a for instance judas as he's leaving the as he's leading the le leaving from the 
Last Supper, Lucifer actually appears to Judas in the shape of one of Judas's friends and says to him, basically, don't go on with, don't go ahead with this. Don't go ahead, don't go ahead with this betrayal and giving the money to the, and um, getting the money from the priests. Um, because the devil's beginning to think, maybe I shouldn't let this come to pass. And then another one is Pilate's uh, wife, uh, her dream. Uh, the Venerable Mary says that that is kind of a diabolical dream. The devil actually gives her that dream and tries to use Pilate's wife in order to halt the, um, uh, the, the sentencing, uh, the death sentence given to our Lord. It's only when our Lord is crucified. And I think the actual moment is, ironically, in a sense ironically, when our Lord says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, the devil is aware of the um, way that psalm concludes. And he immediately thinks to himself, resurrection. And that's how the psalm concludes. So at that point, it seems like he is aware. And, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing for him. So let's give another couple of little insights that we receive from Memorable Mayor of Agrida before I close the, the video. So, um, yeah, there's a really beautiful one about Our Lady. How Our Lady, here's an insight, that Our Lady is basically present so much through our Lord's public ministry. She's hovering around. She's always with him. She's, she delights in hearing what our Lord is preaching and she takes such an interest in them. Of course, we all know that, don't we? We all know Our Lady. Of course, she's going to be doing that. But it's beautiful to, to read it and read some details around that. Um, a lovely insight of the wedding feast of Cana is a description that Venerable Mary gives us of how Our Lady and Our Lord eat, eat food at the wedding feast. They do so with greatest moderation, yet also without showing outwardly their great abstinence. So she's saying that, uh, in, in, as the paragraph continues, that, that um, holiness should not mean singularity. And when it was a great feast, they joined in because they didn't want, they, because holiness does not mean, as I said, exceptional singularity uh, in the sight of, in the sight of others. So let's, uh, Let's give you um, a concluding insight, which is more of an insight, um, more of an insight into the gospel writers. Oh, no, I've got to give one more. I want to want to give one more first um, that this is a really beautiful one as well, that at the ascension of our Lord, when he ascends into heaven, Our Lady goes with him. Now, wait a minute. You're thinking the assumption that's later on, 15 years later, perhaps. No. Yeah, that is true. But also at the ascension, our, our Lord carries his mother with him to experience being with him in heaven for nine days. And how does that occur when Our Lady is in the cenacle at the same time? By location. There's a by location miracle where Our Lady is both spiritually in heaven and then with the apostles also. And in fact, the moment that she returns back to earth spiritually, I guess spiritually, that makes sense, but maybe it's her body physically in two places at once, maybe. Um, but anyway, the moment that that occurs is, according to Venerable Mary, the image that St. John the Apostle records in his book of the Apocalypse. I saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven like a bride prepared to meet its husband. And I saw the, uh, and then I heard a loud voice saying, behold, here is the dwelling place, God's dwelling place among men. And she says that that was the moment. And St. John in coded language describes uh, what he saw. He was privileged to see this. And then the final one that I was going to say was that Our Lady petitioned that she might not be featured too greatly in the gospels and this petition was pleasing to god and the petition she said it obviously out of humility but also um god approved of it because there was a concern that 
in the preaching of the gospel, had Our Lady, had Our Lady's splendor been shown to the full, the pagans who had a hard enough time understanding that Our Lord is uh, one God, one divine person with two natures, um, you know, they had a hard enough time with that and God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to also have in the kerygma Mary as Mediatrix of all graces assumed into heaven, immaculately conceived, queen of heaven and earth. That would have, prob that would have, anyway, at least God was, God, uh, almighty God uh, in his wisdom, uh, according to Venerable Mary of Agreda, was delighted to delay the revelation of these, the full revelation of these truths into a later point into the history of the church, which to our great joy and honor, we are living in. Imagine that we have the privilege of living in a time in the history of the church when Our Lady is more fully known uh, in a way that she wasn't so well known in earlier periods. And But let's make sure that, that Our Lady remains fully known because I guess there's been some uh, backward steps, even though Catholic piety and devotion is strong, uh, but very strong on Our Lady. There have been some ret retrograde steps in promotion of devotion to Our Lady, but let's hope we've we passed that. Maybe that was more in the 80s um, and the 90s, 70s, I don't know. So, so I think that's how I'm going to close this episode of Insights from Venerable Mary of Agreda. I hope maybe somebody has found this video interesting. Um, I have, as as you'll see from the description below and, and maybe from the um, thumbnail of the video, I have compiled a book of rosary meditations drawn from the, the mystical city of God by the Venerable Mary of Agreda, which um, I think honestly is a, is a beautiful way of um, entering into the mystical city of God and using it to pray the rosary better. The Venerable Mary's Writings are in the public domain as also, so you can download a copy. You can go on archive.com, get a copy of Mystical City and a facsimile um, without even paying anything. But um, you can also, if you want, uh, buy this uh, rosary meditation series, which is uh, about 300 pages long. Even this, <laughs> even this compilation of rosary mysteries is, is that long because I put for each bead of the rosary a paragraph um from venerable mary and i edited it slightly so it's in more readable english um okay may almighty god bless you may our lady intercede for you in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen